This is Catonia, the world of the dark feminine. Catonia is now an affiliate of the Divine Feminine app. Whether you download the app on your phone or subscribe via the website, the Divine Feminine app is a great resource to find sacred circles and events related to the Divine Feminine, as well as books, blogs, and other resources for those interested in pagan practice or in the myth and psychology surrounding the subject. Click on the link in the description on Spreaker or YouTube for this podcast to find out more information and to register for free. Hello, this is Breach Burke. Before we get into this week's podcast, I would like to thank my patrons personally. Gwyn K, Politi, Caitlin N, Jan H, Tanya T, Veronica S, Gabby, Helen M, Ruth S, Sunny H, Scott K, J.R.M, Susie G, Eldritch Priest, B. Lupita, C. Roberts, Jeanette, D.S., Jake B, C.D.V., Ali, Thaddeus G, and V! Exclamation point V. I really appreciate those of you who have joined recently and who have stuck with me over these years. Our community is small, and there's so much I would like to do in terms of providing courses, conversation on the dark feminine, and extra content, so please consider joining at patreon.com slash Ketonia. Now on to the podcast. Hello and welcome to Ketonia, the podcast dealing with the dark feminine. I'm Breach Burke, and this week we are going to continue our series on female Christian mystics. And we are going to take a look at the figure of Hildegard of Bingen. Now, this woman is really fascinating to me in a lot of ways because she was such a brilliant, brilliant person. But she had a really unique quality to to her and to the kind of message that she brought as, as a nun. And of course, a lot of these saints were, especially these medieval saints, were also uh, in the convent. She had a lot to say about the divine feminine with respect to the church and with respect to understanding of what we might call God. She had these wild visions. She wrote music. She was, uh, she wrote scientific works, early natural scientific works. And she very much was a believer of, of God being in nature. And she talked about the, uh, the feminine as being imminent and the masculine as being transcendent, which is literally what I have often said about the, the masculine being associated with heaven and the celestial, and the the earth being associated with the feminine. And this is literally her saying this as well. But to her, the feminine being imminent, that's that form of, of spirituality that we that is that is close to us and that we're connected to and that, that provides us with that connection. So very interesting there, though that she says that. Um, and of course I will get into, you know, people who are familiar with Kabbalah and things like that about the idea of uh, the, sh- the Shekinah, the, the divine presence in Malkut, which is in the kingdom, which is the presence of God in the world, which is described as feminine also. So there's there's a whole lot that potentially to unpack there. But what I want to do is I want to go back and I want to look at her life. Uh, I'm going to go over her biography. Now, the best entry that I have here is actually from the World History Encyclopedia. We have, they, they go through, not only do they go through her biography and her entering of, into the convent and all, all of the relevant things that she has done, but they also, they also do it in a way that I think uh, is useful in terms of uh, response and in, in, in terms of how I usually structure these podcasts where I like to look at the biography of, if it's a person we're talking about, then I like to look at the biography. And then I like to look at those elements of the biography with respect to our subject of the dark feminine. So I feel like this particular article is laid out in such a way that it's easy for me to read to you from the article and respond from there rather than creating a separate formal outline. So that's what I'm going to do for this one. I think I will start though with Wikipedia just the initial opening paragraph here. It says, um, Hildegard of Bingen. She's also known as St. Hildegard and the Sibyl of the Rhine. You know, that's interesting. When we think about the idea of the Sibyl, the Sibyl's role, not only in Greek culture, but in Roman culture, particularly Sibyl is, 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 uh, comes from a Latin word. And the Sibyls, of course, were the ones, the Sibylline oracles were the things that really, that were, that were prophecies that were supposedly kept uh, and that if they were followed, that they were going to guarantee Rome's glory. And of course, this was in the days before Christianity. And of course, look at the uh, text of the Aeneid. Uh, certainly he is 
the it's the Sybil of Kumai, who acts as the guide to the underworld for Aeneas when he asked when he goes down and he meets up with his father in the Elysian fields, his father having Anchises who had passed away. And it, of course, it, it's supposed to mirror the image that we see in the Odyssey of uh, Circe or Circe, the the sorceress, depending on whether, which way you want to say that. I think technically in Greek it's with the Ks, but the necromantic rituals that she performs so that Odysseus can have contact uh, to find Tiresias in the underworld. And him and, of course, and Aeneas in the two different epics are doing it for the same reason. The Sibyl is the, the, Sibyl is the one who acts as the intermediary between the two worlds, and they are looking to access the prophets of the underworld, Tiresias in the case of Odysseus, and Anchises in the case of um, Aeneas. Odysseus is looking for Tiresias, Aeneas is looking for Anchises, who was his father, who was struck blind for telling people that his and Aeneas's mother was Aphrodite or Venus, depending on which version. Certainly in the Aeneid it would be Venus. And so what as we know, blindness in uh, both Greek and Roman myth implies uh, the gift of prophecy, because now one does not have outer sight, but they have inner sight. Anyway, not me, not to digress into that, but the idea of her being thought of as a sibyl, as this person who is this kind of uh, almost intermediary, that, that makes it almost an angelic figure in a way. Some people would not necessarily regard a sibyl in that way, but it is almost there is almost something shamanistic about it, somebody who can connect with the other world, and I think that's an important uh, thing. But she's called the Sibyl of the Rhine. Says she was a German Benedictine abbess and polymath, active as a writer, composer, philosopher, mystic, visionary, medical writer, and practitioner during the High Middle Ages. Now it's quite a quite a list of things. Poly, she's definitely a polymath. She is one of the best known composers of sacred monophony, which is a type of of chant, a type of music, as well as the. As, as well as the most recorded type in modern history. She has been considered by a number of scholars to be the founder of scientific natural history in Germany. So, okay, so that's, that's the initial piece from Wikipedia, but I'm going to switch over to the World History Encyclopedia. She was born in the year 1098, so we are talking, um, yeah, they're talking High Middle Ages, and she died on the 17th of September, 1179. So she lived, that's, that's a pretty long life. I'd say that's about uh, 77 years old that she lived to be. And she was, and probably one of the earliest uh, saints to be, to be canonized by the modern, modern process. So now I'm going to move over to worldhistory.org and look at their entry on her. And uh, okay, so this is going to give us the interesting jumping off point with regard to the divine feminine, with regard to the dark feminine. It says Hildegard of Bingen, also known as Hildegard von Bingen, was a Christian mystic, Benedictine abbess, polymath, proficient in philosophy, musical composition, but herbology, medieval literature, cosmology, medicine, biology, theology, and natural history. She refused to be defined by the patriarchal hierarchy of the church, and although she abided by its strictures, she pushed the established boundaries for women. Okay, so now we're setting up already. You have a woman with tremendous mental intelligence and also this tremendous spiritual vision. I, and it, it's interesting, she enters the convent supposedly at the age of eight. Now, there's some disagreement about it because uh, it was uh, another a friend companion called, um, I don't know if it's pronounced, Yuta or Juta, who was the abbess in charge of her. And Juta was only six years older than her, supposedly entered the convent at 14. So, yeah, interesting that she'd be put in a convent by her parents at the age of eight. But we'll look into that. It says, along with her impressive body of work and ethereal musical compositions, Hildegard is best known for her spiritual concept of vir viriditas, or greenness, the cosmic life force infusing the natural world. For Hildegard, the divine manifested itself and was apparent in nature. Nature itself was not the divine, of course, that would be Catholic theology, but the natural world gave proof of, existed because of, and glorified God. This actually sounds a lot like the Church's position on evolution. You know, the idea that the, the evolution did exist and the fact that it exists is proof of the glory of God. It's the same, very similar argument. She is known for her writing on the concept of uh, sapientia, or divine wisdom, specifically the imminent feminine divine wisdom which draws, clo which draws close to and nurtures the human soul. Okay, now, what's interesting about this is that the a lot of times uh, James Hillman talks about the exchange of of soul, you know, soul for spirit. We, the Latin word for soul is anima, and we often hear the Jungian terms anima animus for soul, with the animus being the 
male aspect of uh, of a female soul and with the anima being the female aspect or literally the female soul within a man uh, was the was the idea and i've talked about that at length in other places then you have this concept of pneuma pneuma which is where we have like this idea for breath like if you have pneumonia <laughs> p a uh, p n e u m a pneuma and you know and it comes from the idea of numinosity too it's the idea of this this kind of sacred breath and actually, the idea of numinous comes from the idea of, of nodding, too, from what I understand. But that, that there's this idea of term that we often use to describe spirit. We don't usually use anima to describe spirit. Anima tends to have to do with the soul that is, that, that we, that our, our human soul, as opposed to, that, that may have a divine spark in it, but of course, that's more connected to pneuma which is something transcendent from the human experience and um, tends to be more abstract, you know, one reaching for spirit. We all talk about people in various religious systems of all kinds about reaching for spirit or spirit being described as the fifth element, you know, fire, air, water, earth, and spirit. But it's, but there's this idea that what Hillman would talk about was the way in which we disenfranchise the soul because the soul has more connection to the flesh, connection to nature, connection to life, whereas we should be trying to reach for spirit and to transcend that. So here, the idea that she is talking, so there's a real importance here in the fact that Hildegard of Bingen is talking about the need to accept the divine feminine as it exists in nature. That's actually really a kind of, I don't want to say it's a revolutionary concept, but it's certainly one that would be that certainly will become antithetical to later versions of Christianity. When you're still with med- medieval Christianity, you're you're still existing within this worldview that has not totally disconnected from nature at this point. So as as wonderful as the Renaissance and then the Enlightenment may have been in terms of furthering certain types of knowledge, another thing that it does do is you start to gradually see this idea of the study of nature and natural history and so forth gradually over time being separated out away from this idea of the divine in nature. It becomes more separated as you get more towards Protestant ways of thinking that say that where one focuses more on scripture than on mystery. So even though weirdly this may sound like it's not really in line with Catholic teaching, the one thing that Catholicism and even orthodoxy within Christianity maintain that Protestantism usually does not is the element of mystery. Protestantism is definitely more about reading and studying and interpreting texts and trying to find God through reason and through other things. This is about the mystery. So this does this is not as maybe heretical as it might sound to some people at first glance. From a young age, she experienced ecstatic visions of light and sound, which she interpreted as messages from God. These visions were authenticated by ecclesiastical authorities who encouraged her to write her experiences down. Right. Take take the experience and make it into logos, right? Take the, the, the eros experience. Take And it's light and sound. You notice it's not something that's conveyed through words, because mystical experience cannot be conveyed through words. No, not not adequately. Okay, people try. But you write these visions down, and a lot of times they're just visions. They don't convey everything that goes along with them. And we've seen that. We saw that in the writings of Teresa of Avila, who has to explain with the prayer of quiet and things, saying, listen, I'm not saying that there's, some, that there's a particular odor that occurs or that this occurs. I'm not saying that that's what's happening. There's, But they're trying to be metaphorical of this. And actually, Hildegard of Bingen goes as far as to create another language. She has an invented language that is known as the lingua ignota. So it's literally almost like saying like unknown language. And I'll talk about that towards the end. We'll get to that in, in, in time in this particular podcast. The fact that she's almost inventing another language to try to speak of this is, is fascinating. Like trying to, trying to create a new almost feminine kind of language. Although it doesn't appear that anybody knew this language except for her. And there's no evidence that she taught it to other nuns or to anybody else. And there have been those who have worked at interpreting and trying to translate what is what this language is and what's in it. So it, so it's interesting that she's being encouraged to write these down. So let's let's go let's go further in this entry, and we'll 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 delve into this a little further. Says so she would become famous in her own lifetime for her visions, wisdom writings, and musical compositions, and her counsel was sought by nobility throughout Europe. 
her early life and education. Hildegard came from an upper-class German family, the youngest of 10 children. They say there's not really evidence for more, like that she might have been the eighth child. There doesn't seem to be evidence for more than seven or eight children, but she's listed as the 10th. Possibly there was some deaths, uh, you know, there were maybe some children who had died, who knows. But she's listed as the youngest of 10. She was often ill as a child, afflicted with headaches which accompanied her visions from around the age of three. And that is interesting too. The idea of having the, these afflictions, we see this, we've seen this in the other female figures we've looked at so far. You have Catherine of Siena, who, um, well, she of course did this through fasting and so forth. Uh, she brought ill health upon herself through, even though there supposedly there was this idea of what they call it, anorexia mirabilis, that she, was, she wasn't eating, but somehow was sustained by the Eucharist or by the power of God. But we also saw Teresa of Avila, who was very, very sick, and all of them had episodes of being really deathly, deathly ill. Now, of course, it was the Middle Ages, a time period where we you, know, you have antibiotics and vaccines and things that, that, that would help people not get sick. I mean, it seems like there was a lot of sick illness and death. This was well before the plagues and so forth. But, but yeah, it's not, so it's not necessarily that weird that people would get that, that sick throughout their lifetime. But the sicknesses seem to pop up at certain times. And yeah, so even as a little child, she was frail, but she had these, uh, she had, and there was a com- visions that uh, were accompanied by headaches. And that is a phenomenon that you will hear about from time to time, that people who engage in certain types of spiritual practices and who perhaps see visions or have things may be accompanied by very, very violent headaches at times, or sometimes, even when you think of people who are mediums. Now, again, not... <laughs> understanding that not all mediums are legit. Those that, that seem to really meet the criteria of legitimacy are sometimes are people, and again, not always, but sometimes they're people who might actually end up putting on extra weight and so forth because it's almost the, the physical is trying to create a protection for what's going on there in this kind of this this kind of open connection to vision or to this kind of spiritual realm however you want to look at it now it would be a long digression as to what why how i think this this is actually structured uh because i don't think any of the straight up visions that we we tend to have about the spirit world are well i mean i, I don't think they can be accurate because you're talking about something that's not uh, you're not talking about something that's corporeal you're not talking about something that you can get a sample of and measure somewhere. It's not, it's not a material, you're not talking about something material. So it's, it's harder to talk about these things, just like I'm saying talking about mystical experience is very hard to talk about. Anyway, but th- that's just something I observe, that people who have very strong mystical experiences may experience bad headaches, paralysis, and I don't mean like sleep paralysis, I mean just difficulties with the body, they may be, they may suffer from seizures, and, and, and you can argue about whether or not these physical conditions somehow have something to do with the visions themselves, I suppose it would depend, but it can also, in these kind of cases, I feel just from what I know about them, it, it can be a chicken or the egg thing. Are the, are, the, are the seizures and so forth causing the visions or vice versa? And it's not, it's not always that the, the physical condition, usually the physical condition is a side effect, not the cause. So uh, anyway, Hildegard was placed under the care of Abbess, uh, I think it's either Jutta or Jutta von Sponheim, head of the order, an aristocrat and daughter of a count who had chosen the monastic life for herself. Jutta was only six years older than Hildegard in 1105 when the latter entered the convent and the two would become close friends. Okay, so that means she entered convent at age of eight. This is Hildegard. Uh, Jutta taught Hildegard to read and write, how to recite the prayers, and introduced her to music by teaching her to play the psaltery, a stringed instrument that's a bit like a zither. Jutta may have also introduced the younger girl in Latin, though this claim has been challenged. Instruct, I'm sorry, not introduced, instructed the younger girl in Latin and encouraged her to read widely. During this time, she was also instructed by a monk named Volmar, uh, who served as prior to the convent and the nun's confessor, since women are not allowed to hear confession, etc., which is just Catholic doctrine. Hildegard told Jutta about her visions, and Jutta felt it her duty to inform Volmar. Volmar encouraged Hildegard to believe in the authenticity of the visions and to write about them. He may also have been the one to teach her Latin and introduce her to various forms of literature. After seven years of tutelage and service at the age of 14, Hildegard made her profession of faith and was accepted into the order. Hildegard and Jutta were typical of nuns at this time, but they came from upper-class aristocratic families who could afford to pay the church to take their daughters. Although it was officially forbidden to accept money from parents, nunneries required a substantial quote-unquote dowry for a girl to be accepted, claiming it would go to her upkeep. 
These dowries took the form of deeds to lands, cash, expensive clothing, and similar valuables. Daughters of poor families could not afford the dowry, and if they wanted to participate in convent life, it was as maids or cooks. Now that's a really interesting thing. So the idea is that the, that the convent is really an extension of the aristocracy, and it's a place where you know, young girls go. I, I always find it interesting that the idea that young girls who show they're either they either are destined for marriage, arranged marriage of some type according to their station in life, right? Or when they enter the convent, if they seem to have some kind of exceptional spiritual or intellectual gift, then the church takes them and puts them in an enclosure. <laughs> Says, "Okay, oh, we we see we see this 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 light of this person and we're going to we're we're going to keep control of it and we're going to make sure it goes in the direction that that we want it to go." Yeah, so of course it's not as though there were too many other alternatives at that time, especially in the fact that you're, you're dealing with the way in which uh, church and state were were most uh, definitely wed. There, the pope is the the pope is as important as your king. It says uh, scholars Francis and Joseph Guise comment on the attraction of the convent for young women in the Middle Ages, and they say for upper class women the convent filled several basic needs. It provided an alternative to marriage by receiving girls whose families were unable to find them husbands. It provided an outlet for nonconformists, women who did not wish to marry because they felt a religious vocation, because marriage was repugnant, or because they saw in the convent a mode of life which they could perform and perhaps distinguish themselves. The nunnery was a refuge of female intellectuals. So yeah, they're saying exactly what I just said, pretty much. And this was a way for the church to um, oversee and moderate that. And we're going to see more of that in, in Hildegard's life. It says, Hildegard certainly fit this paradigm of the female intellectual, distinguishing herself by vast learning, devotion to God, and service to others. When Jutta died in 1136, Hildegard, then 38 years old, was unanimously chosen to succeed her. From the time she was young, Hildegard had feared and resisted her visions, but was supported and encouraged to accept them by Volmar. A few years after becoming abbess, she began receiving visions more vividly than before and with such frequency that she became bedridden. She confessed her visions to the abbot Kuno, who presided over her order, and he encouraged her to write about them, but she refused. And again, this gets back to the idea that when a vision like this is so profound, when you write about it, it kind of cheapens it. It's back to the same magical idea that you, when, and you, that you keep things orally. You don't, you don't write things down because writing them down, it, it can have one of two effects. I mean, you can talk about the power of words or the power of a written spell or something like that. Like it's saved for something special like that. But the trying to put something into words also can try to be bringing it into the realm of rational intellect. And these are experiences that are well beyond the rational intellect. So the visions themselves, she, I mean, she obviously had other intellectual gifts, but this was something she didn't want to write down. Eventually she does. But then it says, yeah, the visions themselves then became insistent that she write them down and interpret them for an audience. Hildegard resisted until she fell into a delirium in which the visions, constantly recurring, demanded she express them in writing. She relates, In this affliction I lay thirty days while my body burned as with fever. And throughout those days, I watched a procession of angels innumerable who fought alongside Michael against the dragon and won the victory. And one of them called out to me, Eagle, Eagle, why that sleepest thou? Arise, for it is dawn, and eat and drink. Instantly, my body and senses came back into the world, and seeing this, my daughters, her fellow nuns, who were weeping around me, lifted me from the ground and placed me on my bed, and thus I began to get my strength back. And it's funny that, that she's referred to as Eagle, because Eagle is frequently... A very, very spiritual animal that we that we talk about. Um, certainly there's eagle, of course, be, besides, you know, this is long before it's a symbol of the United States, appears on the presidential seal is the eagle, the American eagle. Also, the idea that the eagle would have been back in uh, ancient times associated with gods like Zeus or Jupiter, who later became conflated to some degree with uh, with Yahweh. But it was, but yeah, but this idea of, of her as an eagle or calling, referring to her as an eagle, because the eagle is very um, grandiose and, and, and soars over and has this kind of leadership and authority. So interesting that she's referred to as eagle. Uh, encouraged by Volmar and Abbot Kuno and inspired by the visions themselves, Hildegard began to write her best known work, the Scivias, which is the shortened form of the Latin Scito Vias Domini, Know the Way of the Lord, composed between 1142 and 1151. 
which in accordance with her vision's instructions, related what she saw and what she felt they meant. By this time, she was a well-established visionary, renowned for her wisdom and much sought after for counsel. Pope Eugenius read parts of the Scivias, approved the visions as authentic revelations, and encouraged Hildegard to continue the work. People would visit Disibodenberg to seek her out, and afterwards would have been gently reminded by the abbot to leave a donation before they departed. In 1147, Hildegard requested leave to found her own convent in Rupertsburg, 65 miles to the southeast. Her request sparked a dispute with Abbot Kuno, who denied her permission and suggested she accept the position of prioress at Dissenbodenberg and place herself under his authority. Her reason, his reasons for refusal are never recorded, but most likely he was reluctant to lose so great an asset as Hildegard, who not only brought in significant revenue, but managed to keep the convent running efficiently and conduct correspondence with important figures who might be inclined to donate further. It's really funny. Whoever wrote this entry on her is obviously extremely cynical about the uh, pecuniary nature of the church. Hildegard refused to accept Kuno's decision, repeated her request, and when Kuno denied her a second time, she took to the matter to the Archbishop of, of Menz, who approved it. Kuno still would not release her or the nuns until Hildegard, bedridden, possibly due to her visions, informed him that God himself was punishing her for not following his will in moving the nuns to Rupertsburg. Hildegard was stricken with paralysis so severe no one could move her arms or legs, and after witnessing this, Kuno relented and allowed the nuns to leave. Now, I'm going to stop there for a minute, because I'm having a memory of Catherine of Siena and the way in which she was taught that uh, through fasting and so forth, or the way that her, her sister through fasting uh, and creating a, a severe physical illness or physical condition causes a male figure to relent. So this could have been caused, quote unquote, by God, or this could have just been some kind of, it could have even be a psychosomatic thing that comes on to uh, to prove the point that uh, this that he needs to let, let go of the, the body refusing to co- cooperate, right? You know, there's this control over the feminine, over the body, and, and over, again, not, not in a physical sexual sense, but there's this control over the person and over these, these embodiments. And, and now there's this idea of by, you know, basically by, by threatening her, her life or her, or abil- her abilities. Or if you want to go back to uh, the, the more cynical view, oh, if she's, if she's completely paralyzed, unable to move and unable to talk and do things, then... Uh, she's not going to bring the money in, right? So he finally lets her go, and she established the convent at Rupertsburg around 1150 with 18 nuns and her friend, the monk Volmar, as their confessor. So let's look at her works. Hildegard's vision is an all-encompassing in scope, far transcending the common vision of the medieval church, while still remaining within the bounds of orthodoxy. She claimed the divine was f- as female in spirit as male, and that both these elements were essential for wholeness. Her concept of veriditas, which was the greenness we talked about, elevated the natural world from the church's view of a fallen realm of Satan to an expression and extension of the divine. Okay, yeah, and like I said, that's, that's different. That's different from the biblical view. God was revealed in nature, the grass, the flowers, trees, and animals bore witness to the divine simply by their existence. Now, of course, she's not talking about it in an, like what we think of as an animistic way and the idea that they all have souls, but all that they are extensions of some kind of larger, larger aspect of divinity. Okay, her first major work, the Scivias, relates 26 of her visions in three sections. Uh, six visions in the first, seven in the second, and 13 in the third. Along with her interpretation and commentary on the nature of the divine and the role of church as intermediary between God and humanity. Okay, so yeah, having this almost a daemon- daemonic, angelic role. She depicts God as a cosmic egg, both male and female, pulsing with love. The male aspect of the divine is transcendent, while the female is imminent, as I said in the beginning. It is this imminence which invites rapport with the divine. Yes, so again, that goes back to the idea of Shekinah. Um, when you think about the temple in Judaism, the the Holy of Holies, the presence of God in there is the Shekinah. And Shekinah is a feminine word. Now, within Judaism, they will not say that Shekinah is female. But just like you also have Sophia, the Holy Divine Wisdom, which is also, there's there's kind of a reference to her here as well. And and you do see it in the Bible. You know, Sophia is mentioned as a co-creator, certainly in Proverbs, and as she who was there when the world was created. So this is not, I mean... <laughs> We, we typically only look at the Genesis story of the Bible when we think of creation, but there are other creation stories uh, embedded within the text of the Bible. And 
this this imminence, I mean, that is, again, that is more of a mystical nature, because you have to remember Kabbalah is Jewish mysticism. It's not, it's not the uh, day, you know, it's not the day-to-day practice of Judaism with more I'm trying to think what the right word is for that. You know, there's there's the there's the practice among in the church they refer to as the laity versus the the clerical or the or mysticism itself is just being this this di- direct experience of God, which is not generally how most people practice. You go to the t- synagogue or to the temple or to the um, or to church or to the mosque if you're a Muslim. You go to these different places. And there's there's an intermediary in the form of a, a priesthood of, of some type that, that acts as an intermediary. And this is talking more about nature as providing that divine, that, that imminent experience of God, that, that, it's, that it's here, that everything is an extension of the divine and of the sacred. Now, this is interesting. Hildegard believed that prior to the fall of man, God was worshipped by celestial song, which, after the fall, was approximated by music as humans uh, now heard and understood it. So in other words, this is a song that's so powerful. I mean, we also can think back to things like Plato's Harmony of the Spheres and other kinds of uh, musical intonation about this kind of musical uh, celestial song of the universe. Music then, she says, was best expression of one's love for, devotion to, and worship of God. And of course, music, as we know, is not, it's not logos. It's not writing, I mean, it's writing things down. I mean, people do write down musical notation and things like that, but it's when, when you actually do things through sound, uh, just as in the East you do things through mantra, and the use of different sounds to, to express some kind of a truth. Like we think of the whole idea of the om, right? And, and om is supposed to be that universal sound that, that encompasses all of creation. Now that's not what she's talking about specifically, but she's still along with the idea that, yeah, before there was this idea of the quote-unquote fall, which really you can interpret as the separation, the, the point at which Adam and Eve eat from the, the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil means that they're living in the field of opposites, thus living in the field of time. And so that's the realm at which you have life and death, whereas before you're in this kind of space that's more unified and outside of time. So it's, music is the way one connects with that space outside of time. And she says, in keeping with this belief, well, she doesn't say what the article says, in keeping with this belief, she ends the Skivias with the text of her morality play, Ordo uh, Virtutum and her Symphony of Heaven, one of her earliest um, musical compositions. I'm going to try to link to one of her musical compositions. I'm going to try to find one that, that and, and link to it in the description below, not only in Spreaker, but also on YouTube, the video version of this. I'm going to link to it there. If somebody wants to check out a, another version, I, I don't want to try to embed anything in this video because then there will be all kinds of copyright issues, but I want to see if I can find an example uh, of one of these so that you can get an idea of what at least she had in mind uh, by this. Uh, throughout her time at Dis- uh, Bodenberg, Hildegard routinely practiced what is known today as holistic healing, using resonant spiritual energies and natural remedies to maintain health and cure illness and injury. Between 1150 and 1158, she composed her Liber Subtilatum, the Book of Subtleties and the Diverse Qualities of Created Things, comprised of two sections, her Physica, which is medicine, and Causae et Curae, Causes and Cures of Disease. She argues that human beings are the pinnacle of God's creation, and the natural world exists in harmony with humanity. Humans should care for nature, and nature will do the same. So again, she's still having this idea of humans as the overseers of humanity. I'm sorry, the humans as the overseers of nature or caretakers because of, yeah, because we're the pinnacle. So, yeah, that's doctrine. I mean, we might, uh, we might, might debate whether or not that's true today. I know I've, I've talked about that at length in other places about whether or not, uh, whether or not our intellect really puts us above the animals, but um, that's, that's a separate diversion there. Her concept of health was based on the prevailing understanding derived from ancient Greek medicine of a human body's health depending on the balance of the four humors of the body, sanguine or peaceful, sanguine, peaceful, or dry, which is, it has to do with the blood, choleric, angry, or hot, which has to do with yellow bile, phlegmatic, apathetic, moist, which has to do with phlegm, melancholy, depressed, or cold, which has to do with black bile. That's, that's very Aristotelian. That, um, Aristotle lays that out in, in his system. Hildegard's conception of the humors differed slightly, but still conformed to the traditional understanding. When these humors were imbalanced, the body was in optimum health. Sickness indicated imbalance. Hildegard recommended herbal remedies, hot baths, proper sleep patterns, a healthy diet, and a positive attitude to keep one in balance. Well, we still see elements of that in holistic practice today. 
An essential aspect of health was virtuous conduct, and Hildegard addressed this in her morality play, Order of the Virtues, uh, completed in 1151. It depicts the struggle of the soul trapped in the flesh, okay, that's very platonic, between the call of the virtues and the temptations of the devil. The work was performed by Hildegard and her nuns as the chorus of virtues and the soul, a female voice, the male clergy singing the roles of the patriarchs and prophets, and most likely Volmar in the role of Satan. Well, I have to say, when I saw his name initially, I was like, Volmar has the perfect name. Like, he, it's like, it kind of reminds me of what the Rowling's like, Voldemort or whatever. It just kind of like, it just has that, that, that evil ring to it, even though you know, it doesn't appear to be an evil guy here. The only character play who does not sing since Satan is incapable of producing music. Oh, see, they've got it all wrong. Heavy metal people are totally off the hook here. Uh, <laughs> Satan's incapable of producing music. The true praise of God. So, um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, she had a lot to say to the satanic t- panic people of, uh, of the 80s there. Um, yeah, I hadn't, I hadn't seen that line there, and I was just laughing because um, yeah, cause when I, we think about the idea of satanic music. Um, I guess that was an idea that kind of developed later on with the uh, th- with different different uh, kinds of notations being being deemed satanic, but that of course was much much later, much long after Hildegard was uh, passed away. It says or- Ordo Virtutum is the oldest medieval morality play and the only medieval musical that's extant. It's kind of funny. It's, it sounds like it's written though in in the almost in the way of uh, of a Greek tragedy. So. Uh, or Greek, you know, a Greek Greek play at any rate. Hildegard was especially proficient at Rupertsburg and next produced her Liber Vitae um, Meritorum uh, between 1158 and 1163. It ex- uh, expands and develops the theme of her earlier play as it discusses the struggle of the soul between virtue and vice, the na- true nature and final rewards of both, the reason for the soul's struggle, and the eminence of God's presence and redeeming love. Okay, so she, there's still definitely a strongly platonic or neoplatonic bent to her um, idea of, of the feminine presence in nature here and, and, the, and the, the role of the body. There's still a strong moral bent because it's very religious. As I've mentioned, things that are prior to this conception of religion, they're not moral by nature. When you talk about the ancient gods, you're not talking about beings that are moral. They're, they're, they're capricious. They, 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 can, they can favor you one day and not favor you the next. And uh, so, But it's not really about morality and ethics, which has more to do with human societies. So, but she's, she has a strong, obviously a strong ethical component here because we're talking about Christianity. She also wrote in this work on human sexuality, specifically female sexuality, describing a woman's orgasm as the spiritual force which enfolds the man's seed in the womb and holds it there. Oh, well, that's interesting. I'm wondering what she knows about the female orgasm. But um, anyway, being that she's been in a convent since she was eight. The depth of the passion the parents felt for each other during sex would determine the child's character. If they were in love, then the orgasm would be strong and the child would be healthy and happy. If they were not, then the child would be bitter and imbalanced. Oh, I guess that explains a lot of people in the world. But <laughs> that's, and, and that's interesting, too, because th- this, this is a period of time that is for the idea of courtly love. I don't I, I have to remember the kind of when, when we had these, the, the concept of courtly love first became a thing. Uh, might might have actually started in the late Middle Ages, so maybe it was a new concept around that time. But but this is certainly interesting in introducing the notion that love and passion between a couple are important, not just oh you know you're going to marry this person because they have money, or they're or they're going to their family would make a good alliance with our family because initially we think of that as a, as a given now that there has to be love and passion between two people it wasn't always the case. She wrote, then wrote her grand theological opus Liber Divinorum Op- 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 Operum, the Book of Divine Works between 1164 and 1174, which drew together the themes of her previous works, but elevated all through the grand scale of her further visions and explication of the nature of divine love, caritas, and divine wisdom, sapientia, represented as feminine energies radiating light. Her concept of veriditas also explored more, is also explored more fully in this work. The greenness of the natural world is reflected in the greenness of the human soul, receptive to the divine, which blooms to life once connected to the cosmic life force which some people would argue was also feminine, but uh, yeah, but, but the- theologically that this would be a way it would be represented by the church. Cut off from divine love, the soul is at the mercy of vice, which leads only to misery and death. Well, yeah, and, and, and then there's something about this. This is like the Kabbalistic concept of the zimzum, like the veil drawn between the soul and the divine that has to be, but the veil is there for, for a reason. It creates this kind of striving towards, um, towards the divine. The natural and life-affirming choice is to embrace the 
divine as the essential and enduring energy of existence, recognizing that the virtues call one towards an elevated, transcendent reality. Okay, so even though she's talking very much about a imminent feminine energy in nature, she is still talking about transcending it. She's still talking about transcending to the masculine. So we're not seeing a real divergence here from from the Christian way of thinking. Uh, there's not there's not an embracement of that divine feminine in and of itself. Although there is a higher valuing in her particular theology than you see uh, in in a lot of cases. Music, of course, is intertwined with this concept of greenness as it elevates the soul in praising the source of all life. So it says her, okay, talking about how she exchanged letters with Bernard of Clairvaux. Yeah, and supposedly Bernard of Clairvaux they thought there was some kind of a discussion about a potential a relationship there that may or may not have been appropriate. I seem to recall that, although, of course, they don't seem to be talking about it here. Uh, Thomas Beckett, Henry II, Eleanor of Aquitaine, and the Holy Roman Emperor and King of Germany, Frederick Barbarossa. She was never afraid of controversy or criticism, and never failed to stand up to patriarchal, ecclesiastical, or secular authority for what she believed was right. Yeah, and if we go back to the incident with Abbot Cano, that's a rather interesting... He's her superior, he's her confessor, and telling her, well, I want you to become the prioress here so you can be under my authority. And she's like, no, I am not going to be under your authority. Just as we saw with Catherine of Siena, these were women who, for whatever reason, you know, we, we see this idea of the church as being so very controlling. I mean, it is very controlling of, of a lot of things, of the whole thought of the cosmology, of, of difference in thought. But it's interesting that you have these examples of these women. Again, in Catherine's case, she was definitely an upper-class woman. But it, it's, like, it's like they have this they have this power and authority that's given to them and this kind of sovereignty that's granted to them through their connection to the mystical which is interesting. So that was just it. So she went on, on tours to, to deliver sermons in predominantly male audiences, in spite of St. Paul's injunction against women speaking in the presence of men. And it says, even in her early 80s, Hildegard refused to be bullied or cowed by male authority figures. The Archbishop of Mans ordered her to, ordered her to exhume the body of a young man buried in holy ground at Rupertsburg who had died excommunicated. Hildegard refused, claiming the man had sought absolution and received grace, and it was only the Archbishop's personal stubbornness and pride which prevented him from recognizing this. She traveled twice to Mans to plead her case, but was denied and her convent was placed under interdict. Only when the Archbishop died was it lifted and Hildegard and her nuns regarded having returned to a state of grace in the church. Right. So she basically was fighting against um, what she considered to be this religious authority. It said, aside from her contributions to theology, philosophy, music, medicine, and the rest, she invented the construct constructed script of the literae ignotae, which means alternate alphabet, which she used for in her hymns for concise rhyming and possibly to lend to her text a sense of another dimension and a higher plane. Yeah, and it goes back to what I said about when she has to write about spiritual visions and experiences, it's like she's trying to create an alternate language to, in which to do so. And it says it served to separate and elevate her order from the mundane world. Well, again, they're saying that here, but there's no, they said there's no real evidence that Hildegard actually gave this, that she actually taught this alphabet to anybody else, although obviously some of her hymns were written in that. It says, in spite of her accomplishments and fame, the church continued to regard women not only as second-class citizens, but dangerous temptations and obstacles to virtue. The highly influential Bernard of Clairvaux claimed that a man could not associate with a woman without desiring sex with her, and the canonical order of the Premonstratensians banned women from their order, claiming to have recognized that the wickedness of women is greater than all the other wickedness in the world. Mm-hmm. It's interesting. It was precisely this kind of misogynistic mindset that Hildegard struggled against not only within the church, but medieval society at large. So yeah, that's why it, you underscore how how interesting it is that she has this kind of power and authority. But of course, she also has a lot of it because of her intellect. Okay, intellect is something that is valued. The fact that she has it is only seen as some kind of extraordinary act of grace from God. Um, otherwise, women are viewed as somehow um, being devilish or connected to the devil in some way. You, you have these examples of women like her who are exceptions to this, and you you have to you have to wonder. I mean, there, there's what the the kind of circumstances. I mean, we're just reading this as kind of a flat biography, but what are the circumstances that allowed her to? You get this kind of positioning to begin with, and then to be, I mean, other than her own character, how to prevail against it. And to what degree, I mean, because mystical visions, um, you know, when I teach mysticism in my religion classes, one of the questions that I ask students or ask them to explore as a possible topic of terms of uh, writing papers and so forth 
is to talk about mysticism and whether or not whether the you know about the pursuit of mysticism and whether the average person why is the church threatened by the average person pursuing religious mysticism and really part of the answer to that is that mystics are people who have again they they have a direct relationship it's a god in whatever form you're talking about is speaking directly to the person this is a concept that originally started with uh, it, it usually attributed to dionysus worship actually because dionysus uh, through the drinking of wine which he was the god of, people could experience this, have had this direct ecstatic experience of the god himself. And this was a term, this was known as theos. Okay, that's where we get the term theological. It has to do with uh, God and the direct connection to God, as opposed to the kinds of relationship that involves you kind of as a supplicant, suppliant or supplicant, uh, making sacrifices. So you would say, you know, making these kinds of pact arrangements with the deities, keep our city safe and we will give you, we will make these statues and build these temples and give you, sacrifice a hundred bulls or, or whatever it is. You have this relationship to the divine in that way. This is, that, that's more of an indirect relationship. It's more like a, like a diplomatic relationship. This is, this is something that's a bit more direct. And how much of it is internal and how much is external is always the question, just as it is with magical practice and magical experience. How much is internal? How much is external? Always the question. So the, the finishing of this, it says, the significant, even, even so, given the, the negative status of women, the significance of her work was recognized by the church and she was singled out as a woman of note. Her cause of death is unknown, but she died, most likely of natural causes, in 1179. Attempts to canonize her stalled until 2012, when she was recognized as a saint through the process of equivalent canonization and was proclaimed a doctor of the church by Benedict XVI. Her famous visions are today interpreted as symptoms uh, of a migraine sufferer, but this in no way has detracted from her reputation. And it is interesting now, again, in, in tradition, the modern tradition of cognitive and neuropsychology the way in which people want to take anything of a of a bent that is outside of worldly experience and try to attribute it to a medical symptom, which is, again, as I've only said, it's, it's like anything else that happens within the body. The body is usually a reaction to something. It's not the other way around. And I mean, and, and I have yet, I mean, maybe you could say that I can't always prove that, but then again, I've also said you've not been able to prove it the other way either. When we have a certain experience, and I think the example that I often give is falling in love. Now I've read papers on the kinds of and not and it's it, I forget the name of the enzyme. It, it, I, I want to say oxytocin, but I don't know if that's right because I also know there's a drug of that name. There's an enzyme that's produced when people fall in love. Like they've tested this, but the way they test it is to show people images or have them think things that would make them happy or that would make them feel love in some way or or feel attraction. And they say, oh, this is the enzyme that's produced. So there's, try, there's an attempt to say, well, if you're falling in love, it's because this particular chemical is flowing through your body. And it will no, you don't, you're not, like, someone's not going to inject you with that enzyme or that chemical, and then you're not going to look at the nail. You know, like Cupid's arrow, you're not going to look at the next person and fall in love with them. Instead, what's going to happen is you're going to see the person who triggers the react, and then that's going to trigger the chemical reaction in your body. It's not, it's not the other way around. So that's why, I, I mean, that's, I mean, and that's not ultimate proof of anything, but I said, to me... It, it casts doubt to me on the idea that all of these things are chemically induced. And I tend to feel that way about a lot of things that people see. I often We often write a lot of things off as hallucination or dementia or certain things. Do we know that? I mean, we really don't know that. We only know what we all, all we say is that, well, um, we can't see it with the with our normal filtered senses. So therefore, that person must uh, is having a delusional uh, episode of some type, and they'll try to attribute some physical cause to it. But my question is, well, are those particular sicknesses that we're seeing actually opening up faculties? Are they taking filters away that exist? I mean, the human nervous system, as far as I'm concerned, is not here to... It's not this It's not this great open thing that people talk about. It's actually meant to limit us in, in a lot of ways. We're not... I think there's a there's a theory out there in neuroscience about the idea of us being an interface. You know, you're, what you're seeing is the interface. The much bigger, broader structure that's behind it is probably more than the brain can comprehend. So, and that's the same with mystical experience. When you experience something like that, I mean, yeah, you can talk about visions of saying, oh, I saw angels, or I saw this, or I saw that. That's not really what the vision's about. And it doesn't even have to include any of those elements. 
mystical experience is something far more profound. And that's why trying to put it into words is almost ridiculous. It makes a lot of sense that Hildegard would turn to music as a, as a means and sound, just as you would see in the East, again, in, in a different way and context. But nonetheless, it's sound that connects us and not and not and not not just a bunch of words and a bunch of analysis or or even you you can you can get it through poetry i suppose you know you can you can write um poetical works but nonetheless poetry is uh, the written word put into image okay it's images it's not simply a flat description of something or or a description period i mean it it, it describes something but it's doing it by cre- you know using words in such a way that they paint a picture rather than just flat out explaining something to you and her and her strong connection to nature here is interesting as well. Now, I think I wanted to finish just by talking a little bit about this lingua ignota, and I'm just reading a little bit about this here. I'm going to include an image of um, what this looks like, what the, what this alphabet looked like, because it's got 23 letters. YouTube version of this, I'm going to include that. So let's see. It says it consists of a, a vocabulary with no known grammar. Uh, this is a and, and again, Hildegard of Bingen is the only one who know, you know who's used it. The only known text is the individual words embedded in Latin. To write it, Hildegard used an alphabet of 23 letters denominated uh, literae ignotae, for le- Latin for unknown letters. And she partially describes the language in a work titled Ignota Lingua per Sim- Simplicum Ominem Hildegarden Prolata, which survives in two manuscripts, both dating to around 1200, the, the Weisbaden Codex, and which is in Berlin, and a Berlin manuscript, um, which is called previously the Codex Cheltenham Nemesis 9303, collected by Sir Thomas Phillips. The text is a glossary of 1,011 words in lingua ignota, with glosses mostly in Latin, sometimes in Middle High German. The words appear to be a priori coinages, mostly nouns with a few adjectives. Grammatically, it appears to be a partial relaxification of Latin, that is, a language formed by substituting new vocabulary into an existing grammar. So it has like a Latin structure to it. Well, and Latin, of course, is a structure that has the verbage, at the, you know, a verb at the end of a sentence, and then it tends to be a string of um, the nouns and adjectives uh, beforehand. Again, depending on the case and number, what the word order should be or how they should be read. The purpose of lingua ignota is unknown and is not known who besides its creator was familiar with it. In the 19th century, some, of course, let's say Wikipedia says who, believed that Hildegard intended her language to be an ideal universal language. However, in the 21st century, it's assumed that ling- lingua ignota was devised as a secret language. Like Hildegard's unheard music, she would have attributed it to divine inspiration. And maybe one of the things we can think about in connection with this is the Enochian language that comes to John Dee and Edward Kelly in their workings uh, in Elizabethan times, This, which is supposed to be the, the language of angels. So there, there could be, that might be a construct that is, is a bit similar, though whether, how Enochian is structured with respect to this, I don't actually know. Uh, I don't know what the differences are. So, but when I look at the words that that they're showing, they show an example here of words that are written in this lingua ignota. There's, yeah, I mean, I could see some similarity there to Enochian a little bit, although I wouldn't, you know, I would not go and claim that they're they're the same words or that they mean the same thing. So they give some sample texts here, which I'm I'm not going to 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 read through, but it is it is something you can definitely check out. I will, um, like I said, I'll I'll put an image of the of the alphabet in the YouTube video, and I'll try to have a link to uh, the lingua uh, ignota in the description also, so that you can read uh, something about it and see something of they, they they list here in Wikipedia the first thirty entries of this language. So it's uh, it's interesting um, how how this came about, and and we don't really know how it came about, but I do feel it's an example of what we call mystical language. So uh, you know, in the sense that it's 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 trying to communicate something that is really some other realm, some other dimension, something that you now she would talk about it as something that transcends our space. Uh, whether or not it transcends our space or is just an extension of the reality that we know is something you could debate for hours, I suppose. But overall, I mean, Hildegard of Bingen is a really interesting figure from the perspective of what we're calling dark feminine. And when I say dark feminine, I, I'm talking about the way, the, the aspects of the feminine which tend to be disenfranchised and demonized, uh, would, even though they are not, you know, they, they may, it may just be, I don't know, it could, it's just, just somebody who, for whatever reason, they, they have this, this either this independence, this intelli- intelligence, this sovereignty, this this 
um, ability to act and step outside of the social order that that becomes threatening to the order in some way, even if the ele- but, but, though I the thing I've always argued is that these elements of the dark, dark feminine actually need to be integrated into the culture. They don't need to be the, the witch sent out to the forest and, and exiled because her knowledge of nature makes her shunned. It's like this is this is the those elements of nature trying to be brought into this this context that is you know through through the the medium of mysticism trying to bring these elements into this this catholic context of catholic mystery and mysticism and again it's something that's it, that's understood and approved by the church but the fact that it has to be approved by the pope it has to be approved by the confessors it's the men who make the decision that it's something authentic and they leave her in doubt. And her and in her writings, just like all of the other female mystics, oh, I'm just a poor, humble woman. I, I, I know nothing. And they all say that. And and to be honest, I mean, yeah, one of the things about mystical experience is that no, you really don't know anything. Like if you actually have a mystical experience, you realize how little you actually, in, in everything with regard to, you could know a lot of stuff and you still don't know anything. <laughs> you know, that's really what comes out of the mystical experience. You are not somebody who has some kind of great, um, you you have a knowledge, but it's not a knowledge that can be put into words. And if you do put it into words, it's always put in very imperfectly, which I think in her case is why she preferred to try to express things through music and why she's expressing things through this language that is not the regular Vulgate or the the, the common language because it's somehow alien from that, or maybe not even alien, but just something alien from the normal experience of people, even in a religious context. So, um, and it's interesting, it would be interesting to delve into how they make the determination that her visions are authentic. More than likely, it has to do with the fact that, that it has to be aspects of these visions that fit the, the pre-approved theology if she was saying anything in there that was viewed as heretical, then then she would meet a very, very different fate. And instead of being viewed as this, this mystic and visionary, she'd be viewed as a witch. And it's really a fine line. The question is, how well do you, do you stay within the boundaries of what patriarchy says in terms of what, what your vision is or what truth is being expressed? If you go a little bit over the line, typically they can get away with it, but, but the, the kinds of things that are being focused on here... Uh, yeah, ultimately, it has it has to have approval uh, from from the male structure that exists within that religion in order to be considered valid. So, uh, yeah, interesting, very very interesting stuff. Brilliant woman, probably people who are interested in this sort of thing. I mean, and haven't read her writings. I mean, definitely seem to be worth taking a look at them. Um, but I am going to include a couple of links below, as I have said. And uh, yeah, I, it's. It's it's just fascinating that that you see a woman like this who stands out from what the World History Encyclopedia very correctly noted tended to be the norm of the Middle Ages in terms of how it viewed women as somehow weaker as as embodying temptations of the devil the the eros that's there but but Hildegard brings that up she does it very very carefully in terms of her discussion of the the, the sapientia you know this feminine wisdom in nature. Which is biblically based. You you can you can point to scriptures that that would support that, but also in the way in which she manages to bring the eros and the eroticism in there, while still maintaining this kind of platonic idea that the body is something that needs to be transcended. So she's yeah, it's it's an interesting. Like I said, there's something almost very Neoplatonic about it, and I have always had mixed feelings about Platonic thinking, but but you definitely see elements of Greek philosophy in there as well. Um, but, but she's, but yeah, but everything she had written certainly fit in with the, the, uh, the focus on uh, divine vision and mystery um, and, and healing through uh, spiritual healing through mystery that you see in the, in, within the Catholic and Orthodox liturgies that you do not see in the uh, Protestant equivalents of the same thing. Uh, so I think that that's uh about all I want to say. Um, thank you very much for listening. Uh, I want to say thank you to my patrons again for their for their support, because I would not be able to run this channel without their support. Um, if you are interested in becoming a patron, again, please check out patreon.com slash Catonia. 
um, because I do, you know, I do have little swag gifts. I do, uh, at least for now, in the, in my, if this channel gets bigger and bigger, I may not be able to do those anymore. But right now I'm able to do that. And okay, I'll do updates, extra podcasts, special live streams, you know, occasionally for uh, patrons only. And number of other benefits in terms of, of classes and things. That's all something I'm, I'm working on rearranging right now, uh, rearranging my school, Scholars of the Borderland, probably taking a lot of stuff down and, and trying to redo it. Also toying with an idea of com- some kind of an open university concept, uh, bringing, you know, not only with myself teaching, but with other people as well, uh, for, you know, who might who might want to come in and, and do one class within a, a semester course or something. I've, I've seen other examples of this. And uh, I'm thinking about doing something like that as well. So anyway, lots of cool stuff, but I do talk about it all on Patreon. So my website is katonia.net. You can see all uh, the works that I, you know, my publications and other things that I have there. And my social media is Katonia Podcast. It is one word on uh, Instagram, on X, and I guess now also on on YouTube. Uh, usually it's just Katonia on YouTube, but uh, now, now you can find it at Katonia Podcast, one word. And also Catonia Podcast, two words on Facebook. Thank you so much for listening and see you next time.